June 9, 2021. There seem to be many misunderstandings and misconceptions regarding the two witnesses or any witness of our father, and I am to address this today. There is an urgency to go over some important topics. So, let's begin. I'm first going to address a misconception of the Trinity. There is only one God. We call him Father, although he doesn't have a gender. Father, God, the ineffable of the heavens most high, has within himself both male and female or feminine and masculine aspects of spirit. There is only one God one spirit of God. This spirit decided to have many children. These are called sons of God and they also have within themselves both masculine and feminine aspects of a spirit. They don't have one assigned gender. And some of these decided to be their own gods and have their own children. Just because they decided doesn't make it so. There is only one God There is only one Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has many aspects. Love, truth, joy, kindness, grace, justice, righteousness. There's so many aspects of Father, but it's all His Spirit. When father is speaking to one of his children internally, in the spirit. So it's the spirit speaking with your soul, okay? And so you don't hear it or you don't perceive it through your five senses. It's going on inside. Some people may perceive it as visions. Some people may perceive it as audible. Some people may receive complex thoughts. When Father is speaking to you that way, we call it Holy Spirit. It is not a separate entity. It is not another Entity with its own identity or something. It's all Father. But when he's speaking with you in that way, he calls it his Holy Spirit. But it's still Father. Now, if Father decides to speak through a human being. We have many examples of that in the Bible when he did it through Jesus. When the five senses are needed to perceive such message, then we call it the Spirit of Christ. It is the manifested Spirit of Father through a human being. It is not a separate entity. It is not the third head of a God. No, there is only one God. There is only one Spirit of God. And if it happens to be in you, the Bible calls it the anointed spirit, the spirit of Christ.
Spirit of Christ is a Greek way, in Greek language, Greek way of saying Messiah. And Messiah is Hebrew word Mashiach, and Mashiach simply means the anointed spirit. So the anointed spirit, Mashiach, Messiah, and Christ are all the same word, and it means anointed spirit. The reason why Jesus is called the Christ is because there was a specific there was a specific task that had to be done and it was prophesied ahead that there will come one who will be anointed to do that task the anointing comes from father it is father's spirit that comes into that willing vessel it is in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Okay? When Jesus read that in the synagogue, he basically said to them, I'm the one that this scripture is speaking of. I have this anointing. In other words, I have the Spirit of Christ. He had the anointing to do that specific task, to release from darkness for the prisoners. Uh, release from darkness for the prisoners and the whole text okay so when they were saying about him you're the christ they were referring to this particular prophecy and other prophecies that were about this anointed person but the spirit that anointed him was father in other words it was the spirit of father inside of jesus and that's why he was Christ. That's why you have the Spirit of Christ when Father comes into you. It is not a separate spirit. It is not some third person or it is not Jesus' spirit that now goes into you. Jesus had a soul and he had a body. And then Father's spirit was there too, and that was the anointing. It is only by Father's Spirit that anything in the spiritual can be done. It is not the vessel doing anything. It is Father's Spirit. So the two witnesses... Be it Moses and Aaron, or be it Jesus and John, or be it somebody in this age, they can't do anything from their own self, from their soul, from their flesh. It's only the anointing, the anointed spirit, spirit of Father, that can do anything. There are many people who identify themselves with a particular person from the Old Testament. I'm Elijah, I'm Moses, I'm this, I'm that. Now let's say that, that it, it is true. Let's say that the same soul that was in Elijah is now in you. And what? So what? You think that gives you some superpowers or something? We are all the same before Father. It is His Spirit that can do 
what it can do. It's not you. Whether you're Moses or Elijah or John or Jesus or anybody, it's Father's Spirit. The two witnesses can do anything on their own. It is Father doing it. Okay, I need to talk about parables. So parables, you all know about parables. It uses words describing something that we are familiar with. It uses familiar words and then we need to find a higher meaning for these words in order to understand what information was being passed on. So let's give one example. The word food. In the physical sense, it means physical food. A piece of something that you chew and swallow and it gives you nutrition. In the spiritual sense, it is information that is true. Well, it doesn't have to be. It's something that you consume with your mind. And it can either give you nutrition, a good one, or it can give you bad nutrition. Okay? It can be truth. It can be lies. It can be something simple and easy. It can be something more difficult to, to process. Right? So, parables are a known form of passing on information about something spiritual while using familiar words that we know from the world that we're living in, from the form that we're living in. A prime example would be John 3. Nicodemus went to see him. He was a Pharisee. And he asked them um, how to get to heaven, right? And Jesus said, well, you got to be born again. Now, born again. So, Nicodemus is thinking in the physical terms of this word. He thinks he has to go back into his mother, somehow shrink, and then pass through her body out and be born again. But Jesus was speaking of... Receiving Father's Spirit as being born again. And we catch these parables. We catch the higher meaning when we are reading a parable. Like it says, a parable of this, a parable of that. So we're trying to apply the higher meaning to it when we know that it's a parable. What we don't understand is that most, absolute most of the Bible is a parable. It's speaking of spiritual things through words that we can identify here in this world. Trying to discover, think in the higher meaning of such said parable is called ascension. You ascend. Ascension has nothing to do with your body being lifted off of the ground. Descension has nothing to do with your body going down. It's all spiritual. So, let's give you an example. Um, the, the story about the crowd being hungry and Jesus multiplying the fish and the bread... If you read it in its basic form, you think this is about fish being eaten and bread being eaten and the crowds being happy and this being a miracle. But when you ascend it, you suddenly realize that Jesus was feeding them spiritually. He was giving them all sorts of spiritual food, including the meat symbolized by the fish. And that the crowds rejected the meat. He was feeding them. Uh, 
Okay? And this exactly happens when we're reading about the two witnesses from one of the previous ages called Moses and Aaron. So Moses and Aaron are in Egypt. We think it's just that country of Egypt that we now find on our map. Egypt in Hebrew means darkness. So it was kingdom, yeah, it was a kingdom that was ruled by darkness. And father's children were there as slaves. They weren't free. They were captives in a kingdom of darkness in Egypt. It could have been geographically in Egypt, okay? Today's Egypt, North Africa. I'm not saying it wasn't. What I'm saying is that is secondary. Spiritual understanding is what we're looking for right now. We're trying to ascend it, right? So we've got father's children being slaves in the darkness. And there's Moses and there's, there's Aaron and they are vessels for our father. They can't do anything on their own in the spiritual world. It is father who does things in the spiritual world. And the way he fixes things, father, is by applying the correct aspect of himself where it is lacking. So wherever there's lies, he puts truth on it. Okay? And you can think of other examples. And so when we're reading about the waters of Egypt being turned into blood, you have to carefully look at what's being said here. What is the point in turning physical waters into blood? How are you going to influence the spiritual condition of the people? There, are they going to look for father suddenly because there's red water in the rivers? How is this benefiting the kingdom? How is this benefiting our father? How is this benefiting anybody? It doesn't. Now let's ascend it. Water. Water symbolizes the feminine aspect of father. In the Bible, she's called wisdom. James speaks of her in the New Testament. And there's also a section of Proverbs on wisdom. That is the feminine part of the Spirit of God. It's not a separate person like that in the Spirit. There's just one person, right? But we're talking about an aspect. And there is heavenly wisdom. And then there's false wisdom, earthly wisdom. Because, well, the darkness copied everything, okay? So if it's Waters of Egypt, waters of darkness, and this is just speaking of the wisdom of darkness, false wisdom. So what did Father do through his witnesses? He turned the wisdom of darkness into truth. Why truth? Blood symbolizes truth here on earth, okay? So he applied an aspect of himself to fix something that was lacking. He didn't kill anything. He didn't attack anything. He didn't use methods of the darkness to deal with darkness. He doesn't do that. Our father is light. Life. He cannot use methods of darkness in any way, shape, or form. Or he can do 
is apply an aspect of himself to where it is needed. And so the so-called plagues of Egypt are not exactly as people imagine. Now let's see what's happening in the world today. So in Egypt, we see that wisdom was being dealt with. Let's say we are going to deal with death in this age, yes? The book of Revelation says that death is the last one to be conquered. Yeah? So death is a spirit of death. It is something real. It is something that comes to human bodies when the people in them give up. It is something real. Okay? Spirit of death. So let's say that theoretical example, Father is going to deal with the spirit of death. What could that look like? Well, let's, let's think of a situation. How can you fix death? So you fix false wisdom by giving it truth. And now it's proper wisdom, right? How do you fix death? Is death fixable? I think so. You just give it life. You give it the antidote. You give it the opposite. Yeah? Now imagine that you have people here in this dimension, in this material world, that have consented to the spirit of death. If father gave life to death, so in which form would he do it? Well, he would just apply an aspect of himself, like laughter and joy. So let's say that father gives laughter and joy to the spirit of death. Is that violent? Is that distractive? Is that... Is, is that is that form of warfare? No, it isn't. He just applied his pure light to something that was dark. So if Father does this in spirit, how does it affect people that have consented to death? But they start getting sick, right? Because life is toxic to death. Imagine it as if you have a depressed, upset person who just chose to be upset on the day. It was a choice. And they meet a friend who is smiling and shining and happy. Do you know what normally happens? The one that's upset is annoyed by the one who's happy. And yet, somehow, the laughter and joy from the happy person is contagious to the one that wasn't happy. And maybe he's going to smile at the joke or just make a fun of himself for once and suddenly the upset is gone. Was that violence? Was that distractive? No. Life was applied where there was death. But if that happens in the spirit, it has to manifest in the physical world somehow. And if you have a group of people here who have sworn allegiance to death, who have consented to death, to the spirit of death, then in the physical world, it will manifest as them getting sick. It's like them catching a virus. Because laughter and joy is contagious. Life is contagious. 
and they'll be sick and more sick and more sick until their body can't take it anymore and they die. The death will die. So the two witnesses are not here to do some signs and wonders. They are here to be willing vessels for our Father. And our Father is life and light. And all he can do is apply life and light to where darkness is. That is not destructive. You don't want to be on the side of death when this is happening because you will perish with it. Now, earlier in the video, I have read a part of Proverbs 18. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So let's say you say you're on the side of Father. Let's say you love Father. You love God. You are his son or daughter. And yet, your words speak of death and suffering and sacrifice and I need to get out of here and it's very negative and you refuse to participate on life. How can you say you are on the side of our Father when he is the spirit of life. How can you say that you want to give up on life in the physical dimension? You know that you are not to kill yourself and so you're asking your father to come and kill you instead and take your spirit away. That does not make sense one little bit. Christianity is associated with sacrifice and suffering. That is not of our Father. Our Father doesn't require sacrifice. When Jesus was on the cross, he was not sacrificed. And in many books that are not including in the Bible, of course, he was explaining to his disciples that they cannot kill him. Death cannot take him. But he can pass, he can from his own decision, pass from this realm to another. Which, of course, once you disconnect from your body that way, your body won't function. It's just a, a bi bionic robot, if you want to call it that. So it was his decision to leave. And you can read it in the Bible where it says that he gave up his host. Death didn't come take him. There's a difference. And what did he do? He had a purpose. He had a purpose to go where there were people stuck in the underworld from the time of Adam until that moment and he took them all home to father and then he came back just like he said he did not die and he was not sacrificed and neither should be you there is a difference between sacrificing yourself and offering yourself to father to be of service a huge spiritual difference i want you to think about this and work it out because one is of death and one is of life where you're actively saying here i am father send me where you need me to be and have me done whatever you need me to do if that means 
going to underworld to, to take people home, that's not sacrifice. That's doing the Father's will and bringing life to those who didn't have it. So many speak of sacrifice. When you believe that you are to sacrifice yourself in one way or another, you have consented to the spirit of death. I would suggest that you remove this consent. You simply speak it out. You say, I am removing any and every consent that I have given to the spirit of death. It is null. It is over. I do not consent to spirit of death in any way, shape or form. I stand for life. Because when death is conquered and you are somehow associated with it, it is going to affect you in a very bad way. And Father doesn't want this for you. There are those who only want to live in the spirit. To you... I'm saying this, it is Father's will that the Spirit will dwell in the matter. It is Father's will that the Spirit will dwell in the matter. So you might feel like you're you're with the Spirit of life, you want life, you just don't want it here. I understand, but it is Father's will that it is here, that life is here. Will you give it a chance? Or will you continue to listen to those who are promoting death, telling you that you're going to fly out of here? If anyone is promoting death in any way, shape, or form, they are not speaking for our Father. They are speaking for death. Look at your own habits. Are they... Are they making your life better? Or more difficult? Are they healthy for you? For your body? For your mental health? What about your friends? Are they encouraging you to truly live? A happy, fulfilled life? Or are you driving each other crazy by thinking of death in this world? Death is being dealt with and it is losing big time. Do not perish with it. Spirit is to dwell in matter. You are in matter. Whatever is happening around you in your immediate space is a reflection of what it looks like inside of you. If you are not participating on life in the physical, if you are not taking care of yourself, this is no good for your body, or your spirit. Give life a chance. 